Well, good evening and uh, welcome along to our service at MacArthur Baptist Church. And uh, this is our afternoon uh, service. We're going uh, through at the moment uh, a series uh, which is Famous Places in Israel. And tonight uh, we're going to be looking at a, a, an interesting place uh, which is called Joppa. And so we're going to uh, read from the book of Jonah. So if you turn with me to the book of Jonah... Uh, in the Minor Prophets, uh, it's perhaps a little bit harder to find than, uh, uh, say, the Gospel accounts or uh, the Major Prophets, uh, the Minor Prophets. Eventually, uh, you come to the little book of Jonah. And I'm going to read uh, this verse here. I'll read the first three verses. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Seems like uh, there's a number of times it mentions going down, 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 down. All right, because that's what happens when you disobey the Lord and uh, try to run from what he wants you to do. Uh, you tend to go down, down, down in the circumstances of life. All right, well, let's uh, just commit uh, this uh, message to the Lord and uh, trust that it'll be a blessing to you. Father, uh, we give you praise and thanks for the opportunity now to be able to look into your word again and, uh, Lord, to learn what we can from this place um, known as Joppa in the Bible. We ask uh, that you bless this time. Uh, enable me, I pray, as I try to communicate these truths. And I pray, Father, that um, you just bless our hearts and uh, stir us, Lord, we pray, to the message uh, that uh, Joppa reminds us of in your word. And so we commit these things to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea in the what they call the Israeli Mediterranean Sea because of course there's a number of countries that share the Mediterranean Sea so we call it uh, the coast of the Israeli Mediterranean Sea there is the modern city of Tel Aviv it's a city with a population uh, of almost 461,000 people so certainly not as large as Sydney uh, but it is the second largest city uh, in the country of Israel. It's the economic and technological center of Israel. And uh, when Israel declared independence on the 14th of May, 1948, Tel Aviv became uh, the government center uh, of Israel, the state of Israel, until the government uh, decided to move uh, its center of state uh, to western Jerusalem uh, in December 1949. At that stage, uh, only the west uh, of Jerusalem was part of Israel. The eastern side of the city uh, was under the control and sovereignty of the nation of Jordan. Uh, so not even the whole city uh, was uh, part of, of Israel. Um, and of course, uh, that reminded me uh, of the similarity as far as Australia's parliament was concerned. Originally, our parliament uh, was founded in Melbourne, uh, our federation uh, to when we became a nation uh, was in Melbourne uh, and there is, uh, it was conducted in Parliament House and then uh, it was there briefly until eventually uh, Parliament was moved to the city of Canberra in the ACT. Uh, internationally, Tel Aviv is considered by some nations as Israel's capital city. And as such, uh, there are majority of international embassies that are located there in the city of Tel Aviv, including Australia's um, <clears throat> the Australian embassy, uh, which is in Tel Aviv. Uh, however, some nations recognize uh, that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel due to the fact that uh, the eastern side of Jerusalem was captured uh, from uh, the Jordanese uh, in uh, the Six-Day War 
in June 1967. So now the whole city of Jerusalem is a part of the nation of Israel. Uh, but of course, it's also part uh, of the people of Palestine as well. On the 6th of December 2017, you may remember this, uh, but uh, the United States, under the President uh, Donald Trump, officially recognized Jerusalem as the capital city. And there was an uproar, particularly amongst the Arab nations, uh, when uh, on the 14th of May 2018, the United States Embassy was transferred from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And this was considered not only controversial, but uh, in fact, an inflammatory move uh, because the Palestinians also claim Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine. And in the absence of an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal, it uh, would be seen as cementing Israel's sovereignty over the city of Jerusalem and, in fact, siding with uh, Israel, despite the fact that there are only 37% of the population of Jerusalem, which are Arabs, and 61% are Jewish people. The other 2% are people from elsewhere. Um, Tel Aviv, on the other hand, was founded in 1909. So that's even before the establishment of Israel as a nation. But uh, it was founded in 1909 by Jewish residents, not Palestinians, but Jewish residents as a modern housing estate on the outskirts of the ancient seaport city of Jaffa. Now, Jaffa is uh, a famous place for a number of reasons. Uh, Jaffa is famous, uh, for example, for the place where Jaffa oranges originated. They're the, the very red uh, colored uh, uh, oranges, particularly on the inside of the skin. Uh, and uh, what's interesting, an interesting connection between us and Jaffa lollies, uh, and sorry, Jaffa, uh, is the Jaffa lollies. Uh, they're, uh, the Jaffa lollies are named after the Jaffa oranges, uh, which come from, originate from Jaffa, even though Jaffa chocolates were invented uh, originally in New Zealand. They're certainly a part of not only uh, Kiwiana, as they call it, but also Australiana as well. Interestingly, Tel Aviv has been called the world's vegan food capital as it possesses the highest per capita population of vegans in the world with many vegan eateries throughout the city of Tel Aviv. Uh, and that's interesting because Jaffa chocolates are made with animal products and you know such as whey for example which is which is a produce of milk and uh, so jaffers the lolly jaffers would not be commercially viable in jaffa because there are so many vegans that live there however for those who are familiar with the bible jaffa is more famous for originally being called joppa in biblical days a name which means by the way beautiful in Hebrew. Joppa was originally a Canaanite city which was founded around the 18th century BC. The city's name uh, was mentioned historically on the ancient Egyptian papyrus called Papyrus Harris 500. Uh, on this particular papyrus, Egyptian pharaoh Tutmosa III of the 15th century BC, he claimed to have taken control of the city along with several other cities in Israel through the efforts of his general, uh, who I think his name is pronounced Jehuti. Uh, later at the time of the conquest, uh, when uh, Joshua led his troops into the land of Canaan, under the leadership of Joshua toward the end of the 15th century BC, Joppa is mentioned uh, in the allotment of cities that were given in particular to the tribe of Dan to inherit uh, and is mentioned in Joshua chapter 19 verse 46 not by the name Jaffa or, or Joppa but by the name Jaffo which is kind of like a, a blend of the two Jaffa and Joppa uh, Jaffo. Uh, in any case in the 12th century BC uh, when the Philistines arrived in the region these sea peoples 
uh, who, of course, uh, took possession of much of the coastline uh, of uh, modern-day Israel. Uh, they took control of Joppa, and it wasn't until the time of David, uh, when David became king, that Israel reclaimed Jaffa at that time, or Joppa at that time, as their coastal harbour. When Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem, uh, we read uh, in Second Chronicles of how cedar logs from uh, King Hurum in Tyre were floated on, well, on floats, they called, uh, to Joppa for use in the construction of the temple uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, 500 years later, we find that uh, after uh, the peoples of uh, Israel and Judah have been taken away uh, by the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity, uh, God restores a remnant. And so uh, those uh, of the nation of Judah come back and they begin to rebuild the temple. Uh, this was during the days of Ezra. And, as, and, and, and we find that it's in a similar way to the way that the first temple was built. So the second temple required cedars or cedar wood uh, be uh, brought from uh, Tyre and also from Lebanon via the seaport of Joppa. Joppa, however, is most famous in the Bible as the place where Jonah ran from the command of God to go and to preach to the Ninevites. To, uh, we find that instead he boarded a ship uh, on, in the seaport of Joppa, uh, which was bound for Tarshish, which was going in the opposite direction. That resulted in, in him being swallowed by a great fish, the Bible says, and after three days being vomited onto the dry land before completing the mission that God had originally intended for him to complete. Joppa is also associated in the Bible with the apostle Peter, who, while he was staying at a place called Lydda, about 16 kilometers uh, southeast of uh, the seaport of Joppa, uh, he was actually called to uh, come to Joppa, where a Christian woman had died, whose name is reportedly uh, is reported as Tabitha, uh, also known as Dorcas, which means gazelle. <coughs> in Joppa, uh, we find we read in the book of Acts, uh, chapter nine, that he raised uh, Tabitha from the dead, and that resulted in somewhat of an awakening taking place uh, throughout the region of Joppa, because the Bible says that many believed as a result of this uh, uh, resuscitation that had taken place. Peter decided uh, at that point to stay uh, due to the hospitality of one Simon Atana, uh, who uh, he decided to stay in the coastal seaport of Joppa. And then while he was there, uh, at lunchtime one day, while he was up on the roof, uh, enjoying some sun perhaps, um, he had a vision of a great sheet descending down with uh, all sorts of unclean animals uh, in the sheet, uh, which God uh, spoke to him about and said and told him to kill and eat. And uh, that's kind of funny when you understand that uh, Tel Aviv now is the the city, the, the capital city of vegans. Um, because Peter was here and he's saying, no, Lord, I ain't going to eat no uh, no animals, no unclean animals. And of course, vegans today will say, I I'm not going to eat any animal products on top of that. So uh, that's interesting. But of course, it was a, a symbolic vision that uh, Peter had. Uh, and it symbolized the, the fact that the Gentiles, uh, who were once considered unclean, by the Jews, that they were no longer to be considered uh, that way. They're no longer to be separated from, but they were to uh, to be gone to, uh, to preach the gospel so that they could hear the wonderful news of Christ dying for their sins and rising again so that they could have eternal life. And so uh, we read of how an Italian man, an Italian soldier by the name of Cornelius, uh, has a vision. Uh, an angel speaks to him and sends uh, and it tells him to send three men to go and get Peter from Joppa 
to explain the gospel to them. And, and of course, that, uh, that whole incident where Peter went to them and preached the gospel and Gentiles got saved, that was a very important turning point in the history of the church where the gospel just uh, went all over the known world at that time. Uh, now, what lessons can we learn from this town of Joppa as we study the Bible and we compare the various different mentions of Joppa uh, with each other? Well, the overall message, interestingly, from uh, Joppa that I, that I see anyway uh, in Scripture is the importance of worldwide evangelism and missions, as I hope we'll see. And just in the, the name Joppa, which I mentioned, means beautiful. I'm reminded of Romans chapter 10, verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Uh, that's a wonderful uh, gospel verse, a wonderful missionary verse, and very relevant to what we'll learn from this town of Joppa. As we study, we find that, first of all, Joppa is associated with going to strangers. Going to strangers. By strangers, I mean foreigners, people who live outside of our own homeland. Second Chronicles uh, tells the story of how Solomon sent to Huram, king of Tyre, which was a foreign nation. It was close to Israel, but it was a foreign nation. And uh, he sought to uh, have him contribute to the temple of God. Huram sent cedar trees, fir trees, and algum trees in abundance out of Lebanon by floats to the seaport of Joppa to then be transported by Solomon's men to the city of Jerusalem where they were building the temple. Uh, he also, Huram, also sent a, a what is called a cunning man, a, a skilled craftsman, endued with understanding, whose mother happened to be a Danite, because the tribe of Dan was uh, the tribe that inhabited the place where Joppa was, uh, but whose father was a foreigner from Tyre. And the Bible says that he was skillful to work in gold, in silver, in brass, in iron, in stone, and in timber, in purple, in blue, and in fine linen, and in crimson, also to grave any manner of graving, and to find out every device which shall be put to him. So a very resourceful man, as it says there in Second Chronicles 2.14, very resourceful man, very skilled craftsman. He was a problem solver. Today, we seek foreigners through evangelism and missions to contribute or to be to be a part of the temple of God. Uh, it's like the story in 2 Chronicles is almost like a, uh, an allegory uh, of what is to take place today. Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So God is looking to build his temple. The temple is no longer made of cedars and timbers and gold and silver and uh, all those various different things, all those different materials. But now uh, it's made of flesh and blood. It's made of people. And God is looking for more building materials, uh, which are found in the strangers outside of Israel. Uh, he needs uh, the building material from Israel, but also outside of Israel. And uh, those who were once strangers are now part of the household of God when they put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't need timber anymore to build God's temple. We need turned men and women and boys and girls. We don't need cedars anymore. We need seekers after God. We don't need cunning men. We need converted men from every tribe and nation. The book of Jonah uh, speaks of God's commission to Jonah to go and preach to the Ninevites, a 
foreign people of the Assyrian Empire. And uh, the book concludes with a citywide awakening where over a million people turned to God, offending the conscience of Jonah, the Jew, who didn't realize that God wanted Israel to be a light to the Gentiles. Maybe he did realize that in his heart of hearts, but he didn't want that to be the case. Then in the book of Acts in the New Testament in chapter 10, we read about God's love for strangers. Let's go there to the book of Acts and chapter 10. I'm going to read a fairly lengthy part of this chapter, but it's just to show what took place and to familiarize us with the story. It says there was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, which is three o'clock uh, in the afternoon, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. Now when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Uh, that's lunchtime, in other words, 12 o'clock noon. And he began, became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had uh, which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius made uh, had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon was surnamed Peter uh, were, were lodged there. While Peter Thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Uh, arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am who, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause whereof ye, whereof ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. Now that's an amazing thing just there in itself that a Jew would lodge Gentiles. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied them, uh, accompanied him. And the morrow after, they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, You know how that it's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, uh, as soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore for what intent uh, you have sent me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine arms uh, are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, 
and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. And that's exactly what he did. Peter preached the gospel to this company of strangers. And before he even had time to give the invitation, we read in verse 44 and 45, while Peter yet spake these words. In other words, while he was in the midst of sharing the gospel with them, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word and they of the circumcision, which believed, in other words, the Jewish Christians who were with Peter, were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, so in other words, they got saved. So Joppa shows us God's heart for strangers and foreigners to be included in God's plan and be joined to the Lord through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The second lesson we learn uh, from this uh, place, Joppa, is that Joppa is often associated with sizable things. Sizable things. Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 3 speaks, for example, of cedars, the giant tree of Lebanon, the symbol of the country of, of uh, Lebanon. Second Chronicles 2, 5 speaks of a great house that was going to be built for the Lord. This was Solomon's desire, David's desire before that. Uh, and, of course, the Lord is described as great is our God above all gods. The heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Well, that's pretty big, <laughs> uh, isn't it? That's pretty sizable if the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain uh, this great God. In Jonah chapter 1, uh, we read of several great things that are mentioned there in the sense of large and sizable things. Uh, first of all, in uh, verse 2, we read of Nineveh, that great city, and it certainly was a large city, probably the size of Adelaide, if you've ever visited Adelaide, uh, containing about a million people. Uh, Nineveh was uh, part of the Assyrian Empire. It was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. Many people lived there. Verse 4 describes how the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, causing a great tempest, we read about in verse 12. Uh, which uh, caused the sailors of the, the ship to panic. Uh, and uh, they knew that there was a cause for this. And uh, so they sought who it was that was responsible uh, for nature, as it were, turning against them. And then in verse 17, it tells us of a great fish that God had prepared to swallow Jonah. In the book of Joshua, chapter 19, the first reference to this place uh, of Joppa, uh, it reads uh, that the coast of the children of Dan went out too little, and thus it needed to be enlarged by the, the people of the tribe of Dan if the people of Dan were to live there. They needed to make it a bigger place, a more sizable place, and that's exactly what they did. In Acts chapter 10 in the New Testament, verse 11, and also uh, repeated again in Acts chapter 11, verse 5, we read of the great sheet that descends from heaven, filled with unclean creatures of various descriptions, uh, which God tells Peter to kill and eat, with the lesson uh, to Peter that what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And of course it relates to the Gentile people. The unclean animals relate to the Gentile peoples, people that they had previously considered unclean, as we read in the passage in Acts chapter 10, uh, Peter talks about the fact that uh, the, the Jewish people were not to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. Um, but uh, God was changing uh, that perspective completely through uh, the gospel. So uh, these sizable things that we read about in all these scriptures that have to do with Joppa, they remind us of the sizable task that we have a reaching a lost and dying world without the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but not only is the task great, the commission that Jesus has given us is also great. It is the great commission to go into all the world to preach the gospel, to uh, what a great purpose to live by, to evangelize, to disciple uh, for the great cause of the gospel, uh, for the great cause of Christ who made provision uh, for uh, to a great extent. Uh, in fact, the Bible says that he died for all men, not just 
the elect. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 6, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved. That is the desire of God's heart, to have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That's the great extent uh, that God has made provision for the salvation of all people. D.L. Moody was once in a meeting where there was a number of Calvinistic Christians, Christians who believed in the doctrine of Calvinism, that God only elects a certain number of people for salvation. And uh, he was asked to get up and pray, and he prayed this very well-known prayer, Lord, save the elect, and then elect some more. I love that. Love that prayer. Thirdly, the third lesson that we learn of Joppa is that Joppa is associated with sets of the number three. Uh, as I was reading through some of those texts, uh, you may have noticed that I may have emphasized three or thrice a number of times. But again and again, when we're reading about Joppa in, in the various different passages about Joppa, we see sets of threes. Sets of threes. In Joshua, the first mention of this place, Joppa. Uh, it, let's go back there to uh, Joshua chapter 19. We're going to see this. I think the best way to do it is to see it rather than to quote it. Uh, Joshua chapter 19. And uh, the first thing that we see is uh, I want you to note as we read through this uh, how there's a number of towns that are mentioned that were inhabited, uh, that were captured and inhabited by the the tribe of Dan. But notice that in each verse that is mentioned that they're in sets of threes. Uh, so we read in Joshua chapter 19, verse uh, 41, it says, And the coast of their inheritance was Zorah and Eshtaol and Eshemesh. Okay, so that's three. And then the next verse, And Shalabim and Agilon and Jethla. Okay, that's three. And then we go to verse 43. And Elon and Themnethar and Ekron. Again, three. And El Tekar and Gibbethon and Baalath. Again, three. And Jehud and Ben Barak and Gath Rimen. Again, three. And Mejakan and Rakon with the border before Japho. Japho is Joppa. Uh, another word for a Joppa. That's interesting that we see uh, those towns uh, mentioned, uh, three towns per verse. Now, I know the verses are man-made uh, constructions, but even so, it's interesting there are sets of three there uh, which can be divided up into that number three. Uh, in Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 4, there are three lots of offerings uh, which are spoken about uh, that are are made on three different occasions. There is the sweet incense, the showbread, and the burnt offerings, and they are, they are done on the Sabbaths, on the new moons, and on the solemn feasts. In verse 8, there are three types of trees that were sent by Huram, cedar trees, fir trees, and algum trees. And as we move on to the story of Jonah, we read in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, that Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then after he repents and is vomited back onto the land, we read in Jonah 3.3, 3, So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Then in Acts chapter 10 and 11, we read about the three times that the sheet descended in a vision. We read about the three Gentiles that arrived to collect Peter to bring him back to uh, speak uh, to Cornelius. And I just noticed as we were reading uh, in, in Acts chapter 10, it took them three days uh, to travel from Joppa to Caesarea uh, to uh, be able to speak to, to Cornelius and the many who had gathered there. So the number of three, the number three in scripture is, is very significant. Uh, in fact, it's a symbolic, one of the symbolic numbers that we find in the scripture. In Joshua, it speaks of union. Uh, all those towns were united under the tribe of Dan. 
In Ezra and Second Chronicles, the number three uh, symbolizes coordination and also praise, the coordination of the building materials and builders all coming together for the construction of the temple. And then the purpose of the temple was for praise that they'd be able to offer sacrifices on the holy days. Uh, so we see coordination and praise. In the story of Peter's vision, I'm, by the way, I'm not making up these symbolic, uh, the, the meanings of these symbolic numbers. These, uh, these different uh, significances are, are well documented uh, in various different uh, studies of the numbers uh, of, in this case, the number three. In the story of uh, Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10 and 11, three represents God's sanction of those things once thought to be unacceptable, once thought to be unclean. Uh, and, uh, and now God is sanctioning these things, sanctioning the eating even of unclean animals, but more importantly, sanctioning contact with the Gentiles in order that we might preach the gospel to them and then become one with them as uh, in the church and the body of Christ. But one thing that the number three is often associated with uh, is uh, decisions. Decisions. When King Rehoboam, for example, was asked to decide how he would rule the nation of Israel, would he be more strict or would he be less strict than his father Solomon? He said, come again unto me after three days. In other words, he is asking for three days to think about it, to think it through and to come up with a decision. We find uh, later Jonathan uh, set aside three days uh, for David. Uh, David was saying, I think Saul's against me. Jonathan said, no, I don't think that's the case. And they set aside three days in order to, to decide, in order to test and make a decision as to whether Saul was truly against David or not. Then uh, on another occasion, we find that God uh, gives David three options of punishment for numbering the people. And, uh, and so he gets him to make a decision about which one he prefers which one he, he was going to take. And he doesn't make the decision. He throws himself on the mercy of God. He lets God make the decision. And as a result, God sends the three days of pestilence. Samson uh, gave the Philistines three days to try and work out uh, the answer to the riddle, uh, to decide on what, what the riddle was talking about. Uh, Jonah was in the fish's belly for three days and three nights until he decided to repent and submit to God's will for his life. Nineveh was a city of three days journey from one side to the other. And upon hearing the message of Jonah, they decided to repent. They re repented as one uh, city, one an entire city. Even the animals uh, had sackcloth and ashes uh, put upon them. Joppa reminds us that we have a task of seeking decisions from people. Uh, will they decide to trust in Christ as their saviour? Uh, or will they decide to reject the message? The gospel is told not just for information, but to get a decision. That's a very important thing, to get a decision. Uh, fourthly, we read or we learn that Joppa is a place associated with spending. In 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 10, Solomon relates that he's willing to pay Hurm's workers. He says, And behold, I give to thy servants the hewers that cut timber, 20,000 measures of beaten wheat, 20,000 measures of barley, and 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of oil. Likewise, in the book of Ezra, chapter 3, when referring to the building of the second temple, it says they gave money also unto the masons, and to the carpenters, and meat, and drink, and oil, unto them of Zidon, and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, we read, But Jonah rose up to flee, from, uh, flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fair thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Acts chapter 9, verse 36 tells us that Tabitha or Dorcas was a woman who was full of good works 
uh, and arms deeds, which she did. Arms deeds is referring to the fact that she was very generous with the money that she had earned from the coats that she had made, the beautiful coats that she had made, and she would give to the needs of others. And then in Acts chapter 10, we read about Cornelius and how Cornelius, who sent for Peter and Joppa, is described as a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave uh, much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So uh, he was a very generous man as well. Uh, we see that Joppa is associated with spending, and spending is a very vital part of the Great Commission. Where we can't go physically ourselves, we can send a missionary. But missionaries uh, often can't earn a living in the place that they go to, so they have to rely on the free will offerings of God's people. So part of reaching this great world for Christ and fulfilling this great commission that the Lord Jesus has given us is spending. We need to learn that spending is a good thing when it comes to giving for the cause of Christ. And then lastly, the last lesson that we learn uh, from this place, Joppa, is that Joppa is associated with sending. Sending, not only spending, but sending. In uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 2, we read the word sent or send seven times. Uh, just in that one chapter, in verse 3, Solomon sends a message to Huram in which he refers to Huram previously sending David, King David, cedars for another project. In verse chapter seven, uh, verse seven rather, he asks Huram to send him a uh, a skilled craftsman. In verse eight, he asks Huram to send him cedar trees, fir trees, and algum trees out of Lebanon. In verse eleven, Huram sends a letter in response back to Solomon, in which he agrees to send him a skilled craftsman. Uh, in verse thirteen, and then he asks Solomon to send the payment uh, for his servants. In verse fifteen, so. Seven times we find the word send or sent there in that chapter, in Jonah chapter 1. Not only is Jonah sent to Nineveh, but God sends a great wind to stop Jonah from fleeing from his commission. And then he sends a great fish to swallow Jonah. In Acts chapter 9, verse 38, Peter is sent uh, to come to, he's, he's, he's sent uh, for to come to Joshua, uh, sorry, to come to Joppa, uh, perhaps with the intention, I don't know, but perhaps with the intention of doing the funeral for Tabitha. Um, I don't know, because she was dead, I don't know whether they thought Peter could raise her from the dead. Um, and so I guess because they'd heard that he wasn't too far away, about 16 kilometers away, uh, that they should invite him to come to the funeral. But when he comes, God uses him to raised Tabitha from the dead. Uh, then in Acts chapter 10, at three o'clock in the afternoon, that's another three that we read about, the angel of God tells Cornelius to send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. Uh, so he sent, the angel tells him, send men to Joppa. And so Cornelius then uh, in, in chapter 10 sends these three men and they tell Peter that they have been sent. And uh, so in chapter 10 and 11, we read about the three men sent to Peter a number of times. I think it's four times altogether, uh, not including the reference I've just read. Again, Joppa reminds us of missions where we are, we are responsible to send out missionaries to reach people in other places around the world. How do we do this? I mean, you know, how many people are there who, you know, believe themselves to be missionaries? How do we send people out if they don't want to go? Well, obviously, we don't send people out if they don't want to go. It's got to be something that God has worked in their hearts where they feel the call of God to be able to go. So how do we send forth laborers? The very first step of that is it says in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And so we need to pray for God to work in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls 
uh, so that they might be willing to go. Uh, not all of us can go, of course, but there are those uh, from amongst us uh, that God can raise up to go to the mission field. And then as a church, we have the responsibility of sending them forth, that is getting behind them, financially supporting them, uh, supporting them in prayer, supporting them in encouragements along the way. I know uh, some of them, several missionaries that we sent out uh, from uh, our church in at Northside in uh, Adelaide, uh, we would sometimes put together some little encouragement packs and we put, uh, you know, things that would remind them of Australia, little jars of Vegemite and Tim Tams and various different things. They were typically Australian and send them off just to, uh, just to be a blessing uh, to them, an encouragement to let them know we're thinking of them and uh, we're praying for them. So Joppa reminds us of a number of things to do with worldwide evangelism and missions. Joppa reminds us, reminds us that we have a gospel to take to strangers all around the world. Uh, Joppa reminds us that we have a sizable task to fulfill. Uh, and then Joppa reminds us that we're not just to inform people about Christian things or even the gospel message, but we're to actively seek decisions for Christ. That's what the sets of three is about. And then Joppa reminds us that we need to be willing to spend money on this great cause. It's a, uh, a, an eternal purpose. And so it's worthwhile uh, spending money in this cause. And finally, Joppa reminds us we need to pray that God would raise up laborers that we can send forth into the harvest fields around the world. What a great message. Uh, the message uh, of Joppa is to us. What a reminder it is to us of the great commission that our Savior has given to us. Let's uh, bow our heads for prayer, shall we? Father, we give you thanks and praise for this place, Joppa, which reminds us, Lord, of the great commission and <clears throat> the, the various different things, Lord, that uh, we need to remember when we're thinking about missions. We thank you, Lord, for these things we've been able to see in Scripture. We ask that you encourage us uh, this week. Help us, Lord, to seek out a stranger, uh, Lord, to share the gospel with. And, Lord, uh, we pray, Father, that uh, you'd bless us. Uh, give us, a, as a church, a missions heart, a heart for missions. We know this is close to your heart, Lord. And, uh, Lord, you even sent your son as a missionary uh, into this world. Lord, help us also to pray uh, that, uh, Lord, uh, you would raise up laborers to go into your harvest. And we pray, Father, we might see missionaries go forth, uh, even from our church, Lord, um, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. We ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week.